Well, hello, my name is uh, James Heath. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing this session. I think uh, this is an excellent session. I think you should look forward to it. I think you will remember a lot about this uh, when you come home. Uh, we're talking about uh, telemedicine. Uh, and uh, I think, of course, uh, telemedicine uh, is the future, and it seems as though the future is uh, getting closer. Uh, we have two excellent speakers uh, today. Uh, and um, the first speaker is Martin Cowie. Uh, sorry about the surname. Uh, he's a cardiologist. And of course, cardiology and uh, telemedicine, that's been around for a lot of time with the pacemakers and the defibrillators and the, the, the need to control uh, these very important devices um, uh, from a distance. Uh, and he's going to tell us about uh, telemedicine uh, in uh, the nephrological uh, area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to come here and to share with you what we've learned in the last 10 or 15 years about remote monitoring for patients with cardiac disease. Now, we've made lots of mistakes, so I hope you can learn from our mistakes. I've done both clinical practice and research in this area, and I can tell you what not to do. But hopefully, I can also tell you things that are exciting and likely to be taking place in other parts of medicine. Now, the whole context of this is that the policymakers love remote monitoring. They see physicians and hospitals as expensive, as slightly out of date, and what they want to do is to move care closer to people's homes. And, of course, patients like the idea in theory also, although they have a lot of reassurance from the face-to-face -face contact with healthcare professionals. The younger generation expect to be more involved in care and certainly have high expectations and use technology in every aspect of their life and expect to use technology for healthcare also. Now, you know as well as I do that there's not going to be any more money for healthcare in the foreseeable future, nor are there going to be any more doctors or nurses. So the same manpower or woman power is going to have to cope with an increasingly elderly population living with many chronic conditions. So this is where technology is seen as one of the solutions for sustainability of healthcare, as the politicians call it. Uh, to you and me, that means cost cutting. So I think one of the clear things to remember is that this is not a magic solution. There is not one technology that will work for every patient, nor should that technology necessarily be used for that individual for the whole of their life with that condition. I am a heart failure physician, so my patients have a particularly complex trajectory. So initially they present, then hopefully their symptoms stabilize and on good treatment, they may actually be very stable, not needing very much input at all for many years. But then almost inevitably, if they don't die suddenly, they will have these periods of decompensation. And the idea is to try and use technology to support early identification of that and more appropriate care and better outcome. That's the theory in any case. Now, what happens in usual practice in most parts of the world is that we're very traditional. We do what we've done for generations or hundreds of years, and that is we have very periodic contact with our patients. And we use data from perhaps maybe 10 minutes to decide how we're going to manage that individual for the next three months, let's say. Now, that's a very little data with a lot of decision making. And particularly for elderly patients with complex problems, it's hardly surprising that actually things go wrong between those appointments. And the only way you can get back into healthcare quickly is usually by an ambulance into the emergency room. And once you get into the emergency room, it's very difficult to get out. And usually, if you're a complex patient, you'll be admitted to hospital, generally to a team that's never seen you before. And they'll be very cautious. And you may be in hospital for quite a long time before you're sent out again. And you go back to the same old system of periodic follow-up which is really not matched to the patient's needs. So that's the old paradigm, and I think everybody understands the limitations of that. But coming up with a new model that's feasible um, is the challenge. So what's the principles of this? Well, just telephoning a patient is one form of remote monitoring, the very simplest form. And I'll show you some data that for heart failure at least, just that simple phone call a few days after discharge, checking on compliance, how they're getting on, what the situation is, can have a big impact. So that's simple remote monitoring. 
And then, of course, we have lots of companies producing standalone equipment. I'll show you an example of that, where they can monitor blood pressure, heart rate, weight, and symptoms. So you can get extra data from that. And then many of our patients now have implanted devices, CRT or ICD, and that can give you a wealth of information anytime you like. And of course, that is a challenge to manage that tsunami of data, um, the data protection and also legal issues as well. So let me give you a quick overview of where we are at the moment. Now, one of the things that's not a problem is having clever engineers work out how to collect data physiologically from your patient and get it back to you. No shortage of such clever people. So for cardiac patients, this is a list, a short list actually, I could have added a lot more things that I could have information on many of my patients every single day. In fact, I could have it streaming to me as I'm speaking to you, giving me alerts about all sorts of things going on in my patients if I wish that situation to take place. What's the rationale for this? Well, it's more than just picking up deterioration. It's really trying to build on self-monitoring and more expert patients who actually use information themselves to adjust therapy and then hopefully you can make that more expert. But after a period, you can use the technology to upskill them. Yes, it's about picking up decompensations earlier than you might do or earlier than the patient might even do, but actually it's really important to think about the effector arm. What are you actually going to do in response to the data? Data has no intrinsic value on its own. It's the decision-making that goes on in response to it. So is it reminders about medication and lifestyle? Is it changing the follow-up pattern? Is it a home visit that's necessary? Or do you need to hospitalize a patient? So you have to think of it as a continuous pathway of data and then deciding who's going to make these decisions and what are you allowing them to do. So here are different technologies um, at different stages in a heart failure patient's career with heart failure. This is a simple system from Philips, for example, on their own television at home. They can look at their weight, you can set limits, they can enter their symptoms, they can get educational videos, anything you name, and really quite straightforward to use. And we can look at the data periodically to see how patients are doing. Then you also have implanted systems, and then just by Bluetooth, they can be interrogated and every day you can have information on a huge list of variables in your patient with heart failure. And then of course, this is very new, in fact, mine was the first hospital in Europe to implant this tiny chip last Monday, it's done in the United States but now in Europe, which actually you can telemeter pulmonary artery pressure beat by beat back from the patient's home to yourself. And not only is it monitoring, but a new um, therapeutic target. So there's lots of different technologies obviously at different times for that individual patient. So what's the evidence that it makes a difference? Well, initially there was lots of small studies published, I'm sure with some publication bias, but this is telephone follow-up here. So meta-analysis published in 2011. So a big effect on heart failure hospitalization. So just simply telephoning your patient a few times after discharge, big evidence that heart failure hospitalization can be reduced and some signal towards mortality benefit, probably because the patient and physician are more confident to up-titrate the doses of medication known to improve prognosis. So that's the simplest form. In terms of the standalone systems, there's also been um, quite a lot, but you can see relatively small studies from the cardiac point of view. Here, the number of patients are around 200, 250 in randomized trials, um, very small for cardiac um, evidence base. But you can see here, um, consistent message, very little heterogeneity with impact on all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization. So you think, well, why isn't this in widespread use? If all of the studies that are published are very consistent, reduction in hospitalization, reduction in mortality. Well, the reason for that was the, the wheels came off the wagon just about two or three years ago when we actually did larger randomized trials, not just little ones by enthusiasts. So, this is a major one, it's from the United States called TeleHF. And this is not really telemonitoring actually. This is patients phoning a telephone line each day. It's voice activated, you know, option one, option two, option three. And actually 15% of patients after randomization never called. So you do wonder if they actually knew what they were signing up for in the trial. And then by six months, half of them had stopped using it. So not a very effective technology interface with patients. Um, maybe not surprising, 
absolutely no difference in re-hospitalization or death from any cause. And at that stage, this was the world's largest study of telemonitoring and heart failure. So that was very disappointing, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So a lot of the enthusiasm then came out of the field. But we said that's not really remote monitoring. This is really remote monitoring. This is a German study called TIMHF, um, published by Friedrich Kohler from Berlin a few years ago now. Relatively small study, only 710 patients randomized, looking at total mortality, but also other endpoints. And once again, no difference in mortality, no difference in healthcare utilization here. But the other thing we learned is that you have to select the right patients for this. If you look at the type of patients in this trial, now these are German patients. They're very, very well-behaved patients. If you say take your medication, they're going to take their medication. They're not like British patients that think that's an option and they have a discussion about it. So on top of that, that was a joke, by the way. On top of that, 50% of these patients only had minimal symptoms. 50% were in NYHA class 2. And look how long they'd had heart failure, almost seven years on average. So these are the natural survivors with very mild symptoms. And the therapeutic level, 95% on ACE, 92% on beta blockers. So in other words, young, extremely stable, natural survivors on very good therapy with minimal symptoms. This is not the patient group you want to study. Very difficult to show any benefit. So they learned from that. They're doing TIMHF2 now in sicker patients to try and show the benefit. So you can see why the reimbursement authority is much less enthusiastic um, about this technology. Here in the UK, um, David Cameron announced that 3 million lives would be impacted by remote monitoring and e-health. Nobody was very sure, least of all the civil servants, as to who these 3 million people were. We think it's the patients and their family and their physicians and actually anybody that knows them, probably bundled together. This campaign was actually quietly got rid of. And this was a whole system demonstrator project. So you see a large number of patients right across the country in England, a mixture of disorders which haven't been separated out in the results. But they showed a big reduction in lots of the things we'd like to improve. Now, why then has England not been enthusiastic about moving forward in that area? And the reason for that is you get a slight improvement in quality of life of the patients, but actually it's quite expensive to reorganize your whole system to deal with data in this way. So the actual cost or value for money is quite low, £90,000 per quality. So in a time of austerity, this doesn't look like the area of technology you'd like to move into. So you can do it, you get some improvement, but it's quite an expensive way of getting improvement. So in England, at least, there wasn't huge enthusiasm to make this a system-wide type approach. So let's move on to the slightly sicker patients, those with more technology. So this is not a typical heart failure patient here. She's much younger than usual, and she's obviously only recently married because she seems to be very close to her husband in the bed. <laughs> but you can see that the data comes from this device continuously by Bluetooth, and then we can get all of the information back in the hospital. Now, obviously, if the battery's wearing out, or there's a sudden lead fracture, you can get an alert immediately. But there's whole streams of data um, that you can also get. So here's just a stylized way of looking at it. You can see episodes of atrial fibrillation breaking through. You can see at what rate the heart goes when the, those episodes occur. You can look at patient activity, which is a very good marker of whether the patient's getting worse. And you can see lots more atrial fibrillation in this example, patient being less active, the nighttime heart rate um, also increasing and heart rate variability going down. So you can see this patient is deteriorating. And even if they say to you, no, I feel more or less the same, you can say, well, actually, I think you've been doing a lot less than the last two weeks. And they go, oh, yes, you're right. How do you know that? So, well, it's my job to know these things. And you can then decide whether to intervene or not. But that takes quite a lot of pattern recognition and not overreacting to data when things settle down. This is obviously an extreme example I'm choosing for the purposes of giving this lecture. Now, and this patient was admitted to hospital here with acute pulmonary edema. And with the eye of faith, although there's a lot of variation from one day to another in the signal, and that's another thing that we've learned with being able to monitor this, patients are not as stable as we think they are. Lots of variation in many things. But you can see several things were going in absolutely the wrong direction at the same time. So perhaps we could have had two or three weeks warning 
that things were getting worse, we might have been able to intervene and actually prevent the need for that hospitalization. I've done lots of data analysis with this, so I've looked at the whole of Medtronic's worldwide data set in this. So this is hundreds of thousands of patients with many, many years of monitoring. And it's absolutely clear, you can get an algorithm which will be able to separate your high-risk patients from your low-risk patients. And look at the hazard ratio here, 10. So these patients are 10 times more likely to be admitted to hospital in the next 30 days than this low-risk patients. The problem is, if you actually look across at the absolute risk, it's still quite small. It's only about 4% in the next 30 days. So in other words, 96% of patients in the so-called high-risk group will actually be fine in the next month. So you're actually a lot of activity with relatively few patients that are actually going to benefit. So we have to be more intelligent about making sense of the data. You can't look at all of the data yourself. You do need algorithms. You need a clever interface. And certainly, you need other healthcare professionals between you and the data, unless you want to be very, very busy all of the time. Now, one thing I've learned with doing trials in this area is that more data does not necessarily mean better decision making. More data means more decision making, but you have to learn how to cope with data on a more continuous basis, not to overreact to it, see how trends go. So this was a very, very convincing study. It was called the .HF program. We published it in circulation about four years ago, and we had a big impact on healthcare, very definitive. This is heart failure hospitalization. So monitoring these patients with a so-called optival alert, we managed to increase heart failure hospitalization by 80%. So the technology does make a difference, but not necessarily in the direction you think. And we learned a lot from this study. We shouldn't use words like alert. This pacemaker actually had an alarm in it which would go off and alarm the patient. So it suddenly make this alarm. Patient would then phone the hospital saying, my device has started alarming. The physician would get anxious. The patient was already somewhere around the roof because the alarm had gone off. And of course, the only thing that the groups would do would say, well, it seems all right, but let's see you in any case. Then when they saw the patient in clinic, they said, well, let's just admit you just to be absolutely sure. And that's what happened. So it's really important that you know how to deal with the data and support the staff dealing with it to make a difference. So that's what we've learn from the randomized trials. And I think it is about trying to manage the data streams. Inevitably, it will happen, um, but I just want to go through a few other points as to where this field might be going. So instead of thinking there's going to be a magic collection of variables, we just have to discover what it is. And then it'll be very straightforward. You can easily identify the problem patients from those that can't. That is too simplistic approach. You need to learn what the pattern is within an individual patient. You need to learn that doing nothing can sometimes be the absolutely the right thing to do, and you need to support your team dealing with the data. In that case, you therefore end up with a system where one thing might be going okay, other things going in the wrong direction, and you have to learn um, to deal with that information flow. This is just to show you how current this is. In England, we're just about to finish a large, this is the world's largest study of remote monitoring of heart failure patients um, called REMHF, nine English hospitals, 1,650 patients randomized, shortest follow-up is two years, longest follow-ups around four and a half years, where we're seeing if in the National Health Service, having these streams of data, and we only look at it once a week, can we make a difference to quality of life of patients, heart failure, hospitalization, etc. So these are all the English hospitals, and this is really a big endeavor because we see this as being really important to try and demonstrate, does this really make an important difference? So not only do the companies sponsor this trial, but also the charity, the British Heart Foundation. So I'm very pleased that we'll probably have the results by the end of the year on this approach. And if it's positive, it's very likely that English hospitals will start reorganizing their services to deal with this remote monitoring for this group of patients. Um, because there's a lot of opportunity cost to doing that reorganization. Just so you don't go away with too negative uh, a feeling about the technology. Here's a very positive study published in The Lancet by um, uh, Professor Hendricks from Leipzig, um, just published very recently, and I wrote the editorial to go with it, so I know the study very well. Called In Time, very straightforwardly, patients with an ICD or CRTD, they just looked at the data once a week, 
And it's not entirely clear what they looked at, but it was mostly around atrial fibrillation episodes. See the countries that were involved in this. Um, and what they showed was actually quite a big difference in a composite endpoint. And they also reported more than 60% reduction in mortality, but in a relatively small study. So some people have taken this as being a green light to move forward. And in Germany, for example, and there's a lot of remote monitoring of this type for heart failure and device patients. Most other European countries said, well, okay, the literature is a little bit all over the place. This is interesting, but we need confirmation in other studies. Where are we going with this? And I'm an enthusiast for this technology. And I think the politicians and patients are also enthusiastic about more remote monitoring. But where is it actually going? And we need to be part of the conversation not always being negative about things, not overreacting, but learning uh, a new way of approaching it. So I mentioned this little chip. It's tiny. It doesn't even have a battery in it. Just a piezoelectric crystal. You can get palmary artery pressure like this anytime you like. The patient just lies on this pillow at home. I've got four patients now with this. I now know what the palmary artery pressures are. They're sky high. What can I do to try and reduce it? And data from the United States shows a big difference in decompensation if you actually control the pulmonary artery pressure in these patients, rather than just going on weight and heart rate, et cetera. Is this new paradigm? Is this where we're going to be going? Um, do my heart failure nurse specialists need to get involved in this much more? I don't know yet. Um, probably in two years' time, with the European data, we'll be much clearer about it. But the key points, just to leave you with it, I think this is a direction of travel. More and more patients living with a number of chronic conditions expect to be involved in this. Diabetic patients don't expect the consultant diabetologist to be looking at their BMs all the time. They look at them and they adjust them, and that's technology to support care. We're certainly aiming towards that for many other conditions. Then you might have a mid-level team member, if I can call them that, who looks at the data on a more regular basis, and you only bring in this expensive, high-maintenance individual, the MD, when you absolutely have to just delays decision-making on data if you have to go through the doctor all the time. So this is an editorial in New England Journal of Medicine five years ago showing the direction of travel for many different conditions. And I think it fits in very nicely to where lots of patients living with the conditions like it. It makes them feel it's shared decision-making. They can see the data if they wish to, and it supports them with self-care. So inevitably, I think it will come in. It's not for every patient at every point in time, but you need to look seriously at the technologies, demonstrate the benefit, and at what cost. And we're moving from just applying the same thing to every single patient to a much more London approach, or Savile Row approach, where you actually tailor the care and the monitoring to the individual patient's needs. So this is my team at the Brompton Hospital, looking after maybe 2,000 heart failure patients. We use a variety of technologies for a number of patients, but not all of them. And that technology comes and goes depending on the patient's needs. It's much more person-centered, but we don't just naively accept everything the engineers throw at us. We want some evidence, and where there's evidence, we're enthusiastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. I didn't know that George Clooney was a physician, but uh, <laughs> um, we're taking questions at the end, so we're going to move uh, straight on uh, to the next uh, presentation. Now, we heard about uh, telemedicine in uh, cardiology. Now, we're going to be hearing about uh, telemedicine in nephrology. Uh, Dr. Pestana is perfect for this job. He's a nephrologist. Uh, he's uh, been employed by the Portuguese government for introduction of the uh, home PD program, uh, and uh, he is also the uh, scientific coordinator of the Nephrology Research Unit um, uh, for Science and Technology uh, and Biomedical Engineering. So please, let's hear what you've got to say. Thank you, Mr. Very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to start by thanking Baxter for the kind invitation to provide this presentation. These are my disclosures. Pretrial dialysis has clear benefits of providing less restrictions of lifestyle, such as more liberal diet, as well as more flexibility in terms of how, when, and where 
dialysis is performed. This confers clinical and psychological advantages to patients who want to remain employed and live a more normal life than what is possible with conventional in-center HD. In addition to increasing patient independence, PD provides similar long-term and probably better short-term patient survival as compared with in-center HD. Moreover, it is well recognized that home PD provides considerable savings over in-center HD as shown in multiple publications from all regions of the world. Just in Spain, PD provides considerable savings of over uh, in-center HD of more than 25,000 euros per year and more than 45,000 euros per quality adjusted life year gained. However, there is a huge variability in the distribution of the different modalities of dialysis among different countries and uh, the proportion of patients treated with home PD, as we can see in green color, remains very low worldwide. Since PD provides less restrictions of lifestyle, is relatively less expensive compared with, with in-center HD, and because there is, there is no survival advantage of HD over PD, it is evident that PD is underappreciated and underused. Thus, it is important to correct the limitations of PD that may contribute to its reduced use. With PD, safe, easy to operate equipment and uh, appropriate training have allowed patients to carry out treatments that have traditionally been restricted to physicians and nurses. However, with this independence comes a great responsibility that is placed upon the patient to manage the therapy at home. A critical aspect of PD is that patients must actively monitor their therapy with daily recordings of multiple parameters, weight, blood pressure, fluid removal, fluid balance, it's just for sight as few. In addition, because PD patients must do everything themselves, in many cases they are confronted with doubts and difficulties how to best perform the treatment, how to handle the complications. A medical support system for PD patients is thus necessary for backup. This usually involves scheduled visits to the nephrology center to assess the quality of treatment, but should also include home visits. Several studies have reported beneficial effects of home visit programs on PD patients' compliance and peritonitis rates and recently, Claudio Ronco analyzed the effect of a well-structured home visit program in PD patients and observed a significant prolongation of PD treatment in the patients who participated in the home visit program. This positive effect may be accounted for by some factors strictly related with home visit programs, such as improvement of patient knowledge about PD features, continuous retraining, discovery of real compliance in dialysis and pharmacological treatment, awareness of patient environment, and possible psychological effects. In our PD unit at the Nephrology Department of San Juan Hospital in Porto, a marked increase in the number of patients choosing PD was observed from 2008 onwards and this was clearly associated with the creation of a home visit program carried out by the same staff of nurses involved in our pre-dialysis education program, as well as in monitoring of the PD patients in the scheduled visits to the nephrology center. The results of our program go in line with most of the published literature showing that PD is associated with a better short-term patient survival as compared with in-center HD, and in addition, we could show also that compared with patients with initiate HD, those who initiate PD require fewer resources to establish and maintain a dialysis access during the first year of treatment, further reinforcing the view that PD is a cost-effective option for incident dialysis patients. However, even a well-structured home visit program will not prevent patients undergoing PD of having doubts and difficulties, eventually requiring 
immediate action. This may include problems in catheter function, difficult, difficulties in managing fluid balance, uncertainties regarding the possibility of cloudy dialysate, concerns about the appearance of the catheter exit site, and many other medical problems. Often, the lack of communication between the patient and the nephrology center may delay making decisions that will have to wait for the scheduled appointment to the nephrology center. Also too often, the assessment of these concerns will require that patients either go to an emergency department or to the nephrology center, negatively impacting their quality of life and independence. All these aspects are associated with the perceived remoteness on the part of the PD patient to the nephrology center and remain a major challenge affecting the acceptance and outcomes of PD. There is clearly uh, an unmet need of tools aimed to empower the PD patient in self-management of his treatment and his disease, namely designed for detecting emerging problems, predicting more precisely the risk of near and future complications, assisting PD patients in shared decision making with their healthcare providers, and providing feedback evaluation of actions taken by the patient and healthcare providers through facilitated communication with the nephrology center. Telemedicine, that is the electronic transfer of video, audio, digital images and online transmission of health data may have an important role to, he to help detect emerging problems and improve communication between patients undergoing PD and their healthcare providers. Today, a secure internet connection with full motion video, wireless data transfer to almost any location in the world is achievable with, an, with a tablet. Also today, most patients already own the necessary equipment that has the potential to be used for telemedicine. And many of them are convinced that incorporating telemedicine in their home care will reduce complications and unscheduled visits to the nephrology center. Although data available on telemedicine use for monitoring PD patients is limited and conclusive evidence is still lacking, there are some encouraging reports. Nakamoto described his experience of more than 10 years using transmission of vital signs and treatment data to a computer server shared with healthcare providers in the nephrology center and reported great satisfaction of patients using it, including elderly patients and handicapped patients. IAC used remote monitoring along with well-structured home visits to target lack of connectivity and ill awareness that affect penetrance and technic survival rates of PD in patients from rural areas in India. And they showed very promising results in that, that their rural PD patients did at least as, as well as the urban PD and the HD patients. And they suggested that their remote monitoring tool might be a groundbreaking driving force for promoting PD as the preferred dialysis modality and to overcome the perceived inaccessibility on the part of the patient to the nephrology center and more so in geographically vast countries. Galar, on the other hand, described his experience with use of video conferencing and teleconsultation as a means of communication in PD care. They reported a reduction in the hospitalization rate to 2.2 days from 5.7 days per patient per year, going along with cost and savings that seemed very encouraging. Although the previously mentioned studies and reports using telemedicine for remote monitoring of PD patients are, are encouraging, particularly in view of improvement on the detection of emerging problems and on providing feedback evaluation through facilitated communication with healthcare providers, they fall short of the other recognized and met tools, particularly with regard to predicting more precisely the risk of near and future complications, as well as in assisting PD patients in shared decision making with their healthcare providers. So the vision for these particular unmet needs 
is that development of personalized decision support tools based on predictive models, established clinical guidelines and novel personal health and lifestyle monitoring strategies will contribute to patient empowerment, allowing more accurate risk detection and prediction, help recognize and manage complications, allow remote monitoring analysis of patients' parameters and compliance of treatment in real time and contribute to solve hurdles that currently reduce guideline adherence, thus improving quality of care and quality of life of this population. Shared decision making consists of patients and providers establishing an ongoing partnership in exchanging information, deliberating on options, deciding upon the priority for taking action, and acting on the decision. Though in initially developed for use in acute care contexts such, such as computer-assisted emergency department medical triage, it has recently been adapted also for use in chronic care, namely in diabetes. Patient's decision aids facilitate processes of shared decision making between patients and their clinicians by presenting relevant scientific information in balanced, understandable ways, helping clarify patients' goals and guiding decision-making processes. Unlike more general health education materials, such as information leaflets, education aids spe specifically support decision-making by making the decision explicit, providing balanced information on benefits and harms of options and helping patients clarify what is most important in their own circumstances. They are intended to be used by patients to complement information and concealing from a healthcare professional in the process of chair decision making and provide a means for clinicians and patients to collaboratively incorporate their expertise, insights and views in order to make evidence-based health decisions that are aligned with patients' needs. Mediating factors for, to the successful implementation of shared decision making have been reported. The most common barriers are time constraints and the lack of applicability due to patient characteristics and clinical situation. Specific to diabetes, it has been reported that patient provider power imbalance, health literacy and denial of the condition were barriers to shared decision making. On the other hand, facilitators of shared decision making included healthcare provider motivation and training, as well as patient mediated interventions. This is an overview of our planned personalized care approach for remote monitoring and shared decision making between PD patients and healthcare providers. Pertinent demographic, clinical, and social data that may influence specific outcomes in PD patients should be collected to allow the prediction of specific outcomes in each individual patient and to support the development of personalized decision support tools. This will allow an improved and more precise clinical evaluation and therapeutic correction by data collected for comprehensively improving coordination of care. In order to inform the risk and benefit information for the decision aid, existing clinical practice guidelines specific to the management of the PD population should be adapted to develop probabilities to be included in the aid. Based on the automated collection and processing of personal and treatment data, the system should inform PD patients about their situation promptly according to the severity of the deviations found and predictions of anticipated complications, the system should alert the patient about the need to make decisions. The alert message will include the probability associated with the complication and must explain the factors underlying the decision. Patients will thus be empowered to co-decide and communicate with their healthcare providers on a more timely reaction. Finally, Online monitoring and recording of therapy accessible both to patients and healthcare providers should allow monitoring compliance and prescribed with prescribed therapy 
as well as a, an interactive interface between patients and physicians that may enable both acute troubleshoot for problems and the means for comprehensively improving coordination of care through co-decision making in advance of the opportunity that would occur only during the scheduled visits. This slide depicts a flowchart of a medical decision protocol using temperature, pulse, and respiratory rate. Each node represents a specific de decision that leaves drawing the conclusion. However, some nodes imply a temporal notion where a specific observation must be repeated, for example, after 30 minutes before it is confirmed. In this slide, we represent the client-server architecture of a computer-based decision support system applied to the medical decision protocol for diagnosis of tachypnea and fever. The decision support system receives information from patients, temperature, pulse, and respiratory rate, and on the basis of the flowchart presented in the previous slide, it predicts tachypnea and or fever, it informs the patients and healthcare providers, it gives an explanation underlying the proposed diagnosis and offers a plan of action. In this next slide, we represent the client-server architecture of a proposed computer-based decision support system applied to the medical decision protocol for diagnosis of volume overload and or volume depletion in PD patients. The decision support system receives information from sensors and other inputs evaluating parameters related with patient's volume status, such as blood pressure, weight and change in weight, impedance, ultrafiltration volume, patient-related parameters determining fluid removal, such as residual renal function, body mass index, peritoneal transport type, and prescription-related factors determining fluid removal, such as PD modality, frequency of, of exchanges per day, volume of, of each exchange, dwell time, tonicity of dialysate. And on the basis of the medical decision protocol, it may allow predict volume expansion or volume depletion. It informs the patients and healthcare providers, gives an explanation underlying the proposed diagnosis, and offers a plan of action. For the development of the proposed approach, an ICT system must be refined to support PD patients and healthcare providers in shared decision making, taking into consideration the provision of different types of inputs to the predictive system by the patient himself and remote sensors, the facilitated communication between patients, caregivers and healthcare providers, and the design and usability for patients with different levels of health, literacy and gender. In summary, the ultimate clinical ambition, this is really an ambition of the presented approach, is that enhanced medical supervision and improved clinical outcomes of patients undergoing PD will be accomplished in the near future through better integration of home and personalized healthcare monitoring systems and health, in health solutions for secure and effective transmission of data and communication between patients and healthcare providers, incorporating appropriate decision support tools targeting the patient's needs for shared decision making with healthcare providers. This approach, focusing on predictive systems based on computer modeling, is expected to ensure a, a sound rationale for current clinical decision making that will be used to refine interactions between patients and the healthcare providers and to ameliorate the supervision through better monitoring and management of the care process. And will that, with that I will finish. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much for bringing the picture up to date on nephrology, uh, particularly peritoneal dialysis. And I'm just thinking this will be very well, uh, mainly the APD or CAPD? Both for both. Uh, naturally, we, we, uh, patients with CAPD, they, they have uh, a lot of uh, 
of, uh, of parameters to, 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 to record and, to, and, and they will be free with this system from the beginning in relation with uh, this recording, but it can be applied to both CAPD and APD patients. Uh, are there any questions? Please either come to the microphone or shout very loud. Because I've got a lot of questions. <laughs> Let, let's, one there, thank you. Um, just, it goes really to both of you. Have you thought about involving the local family doctors in this system as well? So where I work, we may have home hemo and home PD patients up to a thousand kilometers away from the base hospital. So we do need to uh, include our local general practitioners. And I wonder if you, you include them in this sort of decision making at all. Shall I start um, first? Um, we've tried very hard to interest family practitioners in heart failure management. They're not interested. Frankly, they see it as too complex, too high risk, and they'd much rather that it's done elsewhere. They're not obstructive. They're very pleased for people to be doing it, but they don't really want to get involved. What we find then is that we end up being the care provider, not just for heart failure, but for the other medical problems, because that's an easy way into healthcare. So we have to manage expectations on several levels. I think in principle what you're saying is absolutely essential. It's been extremely difficult across the world to interest primary care practitioners at a time when they feel under threat to do, take on new responsibilities and new roles and technologies. So I, I like what you say, but it's really difficult in practice for cardiology. Well, in my experience, the, the, I don't think that uh, uh, the, the primary care practitioners may, may have an important role in, in, in this subject related with the, with the, the, the monitoring of, of patients on home PD. I, 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 I think that the, 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 the health care providers from uh, related with the, within the nephrology center may be better uh, uh, adapted to, to aid and to follow up and to monitor these patients. And uh, as I have shown, I have, we have had a, a very good experience when we, we uh, created the home visit programs with the same staff of nurses that uh, were carrying out the pre-dialysis education program in our... So I, I don't feel at very comfortable uh, with the, the, uh, the transmission of these, these responsibilities for, for primary care. I'd just like to mention we still maintain a home visit program even up to 800 kilometers away. We still, our patients still get home visits. Your Mays. Yes. Your Mays from uh, Leuven, Belgium. Um, what do you think would be a suitable endpoint study for a randomized controlled trial for the peritoneal dialysis program showing that all this additional effort is worth the money? Yeah. Well, th this is the, the most important uh, uh, question. Uh, we, we should have uh, pilot studies that, uh, that uh, uh, may allow to, to show uh, a decrease in, in patients' uh, hospitalizations and uh, uh, episodes of peritonitis, and decrease in exit site uh, infections, uh, mortality. So uh, we should have the, the same endpoints uh, assessed in, in this kind of... Uh, Do you believe it will be possible to demonstrate reduced mortality as I think uh, about all studies in end renal patients fail to demonstrate yeah. reduced mortality? It, it will be difficult, I, I, I think. But, but I, I wouldn't abandon the idea that you do need evidence, but you need to think about which stakeholders you're trying to persuade. And there's a clinical community saying, this is the way we've done it for years, why should we change type arguments. And then you've got the reimbursement authorities, and of course that's a different process in each country. But generally, people will say, I don't care how much you redesign, provided you're not asking me to pay a single cent more for what you do. If you want to get more money, you need to persuade me as a person with the money that it's a good way to spend money. So ultimately, you're appealing to them, and they're the want to see more efficient, sustainable use of healthcare, same number of staff managing a larger number of PD patients with less expenditure overall in that envelope. 
And that's something you need to factor into the equation as well. So it's a very good question and quite complex to answer, but I think you need an evidence base that persuades clinicians and the reimbursement, whatever that means in your country. But ultimately, a lot of this is seen as becoming industry standard. So like in a car now, you'd expect to have air conditioning. Nobody expects to pay more for air conditioning now. It's industry standard. So I suspect in PD that patients will expect some sort of remote monitoring facility in that process. And you just have to provide that without necessarily having more funding for that. So I think it's a complex area. So it'd be interesting to see how you manage to solve that problem. It's been a challenge in cardiology. I'd like to comment on this one. I, mean, uh, I have great difficulty with my patients, and I, I understand that every other uh, centre has it. Our patients are, on average, one and a half kilos overhydrated. They come to my clinic time after time after time. They're hypertensive and overhydrated. I talk about diuretics. I talk about salt restriction. I talk about fluid restriction. Maybe I will increase the uh, <coughs> osmos osmolality of my fluids, but it's it's difficult. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we were getting daily feedbacks of our patient's hydration status, being able to correct it either by uh, telephone or by even adjusting uh, the osmolality by remote control. That is uh, a randomized controlled trial that might well actually uh, change mortality because we know that overhydration is a risk factor uh, for increased mortality. If that's the plan, uh, come to our hospital in. Thank you. Please. I just wanted to point out toward the latter question, uh, in the United States, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid is intensely interested in this. They just uh, completed funding uh, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation of a three-year study of remote patient monitoring at George Washington University to examine both clinical and economic outcomes uh, in peritoneal dialysis patients. So again, there's a lot of interest around it. Uh, and uh, again, one of, the, one of the issues I think the uh, investigators at George Washington felt is that CMS did not enable them to um, equate a face-to-face -face visit with a remote, a remote visit, and that's something that they are now in the process of examining. So again, it is being evaluated intensely. It's interesting, my chief executive, when he sees me in the corridor, he says, every time you talk to me about improving care for your patients, I worry, because we get paid for face-to-face -face contacts, we get paid for hospitalization, everything you do is about reducing that. So the income stream comes down, and you tell me this makes sense, explain that to me. So I think we have our own challenges, even within our own organizations, to try and restructure care, and reimbursement always lags behind the best care. It's a real difficult thing to do. Um, um, I'm Dr. Eric from Tanzania. I have a question specific for Dr. Koi. Uh, in, the, in the future, I would like to know about the issue of security and confidentiality for this uh, e-health system. For example, m maybe I would like to hack into the system and know the heart rate of Richard Hammond. So uh, how do you address this issue? Of well, if you're going to know the effort of hacking, I'd go for something more interesting than Richard Hammond's heart rate, frankly. But <laughs> apart from that, I think you're absolutely right. And there's lots of concerns around the world, and it does vary tremendously from one country to another about the data protection rules and society's concern. However, having said that, I think electronic medical records are now recognized as being the only sustainable way of recording medical data. Some countries, patients have free access to the electronic medical record. That's not a problem. Other countries think that's far too far, far too many restrictions. So it's very country specific. The EU, for example, is struggling to come up with a consistent approach that covers the different level of anxiety from different places. The, the North American experience with Snowden, of course, has made everybody much more conscious of data issues. So I'm not belittling it but I think it's often used as an excuse to not even explore an area. I think the data protection issues can be worked through, but very country specific. And interesting, you come from Tanzania. Um, Tanzania and most of Sub-Saharan Africa has jumped and left landline technology behind straight to 3G and 4G, which actually works extremely well for your system, especially when people are so geographically distant. So actually, it's really interesting to see that some parts of the world where you think this would be very slow to be taken up actually are leaping in front of countries with much more wealth. So it's a very interesting thing. It's challenging our understanding of the whole area. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I've got a question. As I, wh when I listened to your talk, it sounded to me as though there were two kinds of data that's being uh, reported or monitored. One is automatic data uh, from the uh, night cycler or your pacemaker or whatever, and the other is data uh, that the patient has to put into the system. This would uh, maybe they have to make their own bioimpedance uh, measurement. They have to may have to measure their own blood pressure, their own weight, or symptoms. Now, what are you going to do uh, when they don't do this, so the non-compliant patient? Are you going to ring to them and remind them with a sort of kind of uh, big brother uh, attitude, or what are you, are you just going to live with it? Well, I wouldn't ever use the phrase big brother because it's so loaded with connotations. Yeah. I think patients actually um, get concerned when they never hear back from the hospital. They do all the data collection and nobody ever responds, and they wonder if it's just disappearing and nobody's looking at it. So they're actually, many of them are reassured when you phone up and say, we notice you haven't done recordings this week. Some of my patients are very intelligently non-compliant. They take a Chinese meal, they get salt, they put on a bit of weight, then they don't do their weight until the weight comes back down again. Then they start again. You phone them up and they go, oh, yes, yes, a little bit of a technical problem over the weekend. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's real life. And actually, it's that kind of relationship with your patients. It's partnership and learning what they like and what they don't like to do, which is great fun. In heart failure, I think probably a bit like peritoneal dialysis, patients know if they misbehave for too long, they will run into problems. So non-compliance, et cetera, is less of an issue than if you're monitoring a simple thing with no symptoms. So and for my patients, if you select them carefully, it's fine. But don't get me wrong. Some patients, you explain to them and say, that's the last thing I want to get involved with. Absolutely not. And that's fine. You know. OK. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Go home. Think about it. You'll hear more later. <laughs>